Okay. Uh, let's get started. I'm sorry for the uh, delay. I had some uh, metro trouble. Um, final lecture. Uh, today we're not going to discuss anything new, or at least not, uh, not anything that you need to know for the exam. Um, we're just going to do a review and have a little bit of a reflection and an outlook on what all of this means and uh, why it's important. There we go. So I'll start with an actual review. Oh. An actual review of the material, first linearly and then trying to tease out some of the recurring subjects. Uh, then I'll tell you what to focus on for the exam, which I guess is important information. Uh, and I'd like to discuss some exam strategies in general, uh, some things that um, might be useful, might not. Uh, so that's the first half. And the second half, um, just a little bit of reflection. So what did we not talk about? Uh, just to give you a sense of, of what you don't know yet about machine learning. And then uh, something I didn't talk very much about in the during the lecture, not as much as I would have liked to, but the, um, the outlooks of what machine learning is going to mean for the future, uh, for your jobs and your lives in the future, and also what uh, the impact it's going to have or is having on society which I think is a, a, um, an increasingly important subject to discuss and to think about. But that's after the break. Uh, so to start with, just uh, I tried to fit everything in very neatly into one picture that I could discuss in 45 minutes. I didn't really manage, so I thought to start with, I'll just run through all the lectures that we've done, and I'll show you one slide from each, the, either the most important slide or the most uh, relevant. Uh, so we'll just quickly go through the whole series of lectures. So cast your minds back to eight weeks ago, seven weeks ago, uh, in the other lecture room during the introduction. And I showed you this slide, which is the basic machine learning recipe. So I hope you're all now, this is now very familiar uh, material to you. Basically, if you want to, if you have a problem that you think might be solved by machine learning, you uh, translate it into a machine learning problem in this way. You abstract it to some standard tasks, like classification or regression. You choose your instances and your features. Choose your model class, and you run a search for a good model. So that's the basic approach to machine learning. Uh, and what we've also seen now afterwards is uh, some of the places where this doesn't quite fit. Or maybe you have sequential data or your data is a big matrix of user ratings, and it doesn't quite fit this idea of separating everything into instances and features. Um, but still, for most of your problems, this is a good, starting, uh, a good place to start. So then we talked about, um, well, the lecture was called Linear Models, but the lecture is actually mostly about how to search for a good linear model. And the most important concept we saw there by far was uh, the algorithm of gradient descent, which is a principle of um, in your model space, using a loss function to determine how good every single model is, which gives you a loss surface over your model space. If your model space is 2D, you can think of the loss surface as a sort of rolling hills. And if you find the lowest point in that loss surface, in that landscape, that will be your best model according to this loss function. So what a search algorithm does, it, try, it tries as much as possible to travel downhill. And the most efficient way to travel downhill, or one of the most efficient ways, is gradient descent. And as you've seen, this, uh, this algorithm has come back a lot, and is basically what powers, uh, well, probably 80% at least of machine learning today. And the idea is just that for a given model at a given point, you compute the gradient, which is the direction of steepest descent, so where the function travels up the most. So you take a small step in the opposite direction, uh, hence the minus, 
uh, where eta defines what you mean by small, and you just repeat that until you get to a good model. That's gradient descent, and it's probably the most uh, the most important um, optimization algorithm we have, and also the simplest. Oh, my thing is really not working today. Um, so then we talked about methodology. We oh yeah. Ah, that's a good question. Uh, so the question is, if you have a loss surface which is not smooth, so gradient descent likes smooth loss surfaces, uh, are there things you can do to smooth your loss surface? Um, and basically your loss surface depends on your loss function, which depends on two things, your model and your data. Now your data you usually can't change, your data defines your problem. So you have to look at the model. Um, and what you see, for instance, if you take these um, ResNet connections, I don't know if you remember this from the AlphaGo lecture. So if you have a neural network, these are neural network layers, then you can put a kind of skip layer in there, where most of the information at the start of training travels, uh, bypasses these layers, and then as training progresses, you set a, a function, uh, you set a, a value here that um, increases the amount of information that passes through the layers. Um, these kinds of things, there are actually visualizations for this that show you that this kind of smooths out the loss surface. So mostly uh, you do this, if you have a complicated model like a big neural network, you can do this by changing the model. Um, another thing that helps is um, making your output probabilistic. So instead of having your model output one single value, if you make your model output a probability, like we did, for instance, in logistic regression, right? We had linear regression where your model just outputs for some x. You draw a line, your model just outputs y. Uh, oh, I shouldn't call it regression, sorry. Forget this picture. Uh, so we have standard classification. Forget I said regression. So in 1D, you get some classes, pluses and uh, crosses. Uh, if you make your model just output uh, pluses and crosses, so uh, just, a, just a single class, you can get a very rigid loss surface. For instance, if you use accuracy as loss, you get this very unhelpful loss surface where everything's flat, right? Oh, sorry which we saw in this specific lecture. Um, but then if you turn that into a probability, so you make the um, classifier output the probability of a cross or the probability of a plus using the sigmoid function, then you get a smoother loss surface. <coughs> and you can do this with um, neural networks as well. Uh, so you can make the last layer of your, out, uh, of your neural network the parameters of a probability distribution. We saw that in lecture Deep Learning 2. And that also helps to smooth the loss surface. So there, uh, yes, in answer to your question, there's lots of ways. Um, so then we paused the, um, the models and the search for a while, and we uh, looked for one week at the methodology of machine learning. What's outside? What do you do before you start machine learning? What do, what do you do after? Uh, <clears throat> and the most important thing probably is this slide, is the idea of a test and a validation and a training set. So firstly, the idea that you withhold the test set, so that you don't uh, judge your model on the training data, because that's the data that it's seen. So you can't really, a model that does very well on your training data doesn't, uh, isn't necessarily a very good model, because it might be remembering, it might be overfitting. Uh, so you split off a test set, first of all. You uh, withhold that to test your model on after training. But then if you use your test set multiple times to confirm multiple hypotheses, hypotheses you're doing multiple hypothesis testing. And that can also give you very um, incorrect results. 
and tell you the wrong thing. So basically what you want to do, if you want to be sure about something, you need to uh, only use your test set once, ideally, mm -hmm. so that you reduce this multiple testing. So eventually you're going to come up with a hypothesis like um, SVMs prepped in this way, if I prep my data in this way, if I use SVMs with C set to 0 0.1 and a Gaussian kernel uh, uh, or a, uh, well, any kind of kernel, if I use all of those things, then I get a better performance than this baseline by 0 0.3. That's your hypothesis. And then, after you've stated your hypothesis, you can test it on the test set, whether or not it's true. Which means that to come up with all of these things and to come up with your hypothesis, um, you need to test and train different things. So you need to train uh, to evaluate your hyperparameters, for instance. Uh, and to do that, you split the rest of your data into a training and a validation set. And during most of your process, you work only with those two. And then finally, you use all the training data you have and you test only once on the test set. So it's a very important principle uh, before you start thinking about how all these machine learning algorithms work, you need to know how to do experiments on them. And this is the most important principle in doing experiments on a machine learning, yes? Uh, good question again. Um, so in practice, uh, so this is the simplest way of doing it. Of, uh, what we talked about later in the lecture is cross-validation, where you do uh, multiple loops here over these. Uh, uh, you use your training that uh, set in multiple folds in a loop. Um, so the question is, is this ever done in practice, or does everybody always use cross-validation? Because cross-validation is much more popular. Um, I think no, there are, there are definitely cases where this is the case, especially in deep learning. Because if you do cross-validation, let's say you do five-fold cross-validation, you have to train your model five times and test it five times. And that can actually be quite expensive. Uh, for instance, also um, in support vector machines, they can get quite expensive. Um, especially if you have multiple things that you want to test. So if you uh, let's say you have some hyperparameter that you want to test, or a set, set of hyperparameters, and you do five-fold cross-validation. Uh, but then if you also want to uh, determine your early stopping criterion, or in tree search you want to prune your search tree, you have another hyperparameter that you need to, uh, hyperparameter of your so search algorithm that you need to tune internally. So then within every five-fold cross-validation, you need to do another five-fold cross-validation. So in total, you're training 25 times. And then if you have, let's say, 25 hyperparameters, uh, 25 different settings for your hyperparameters, you train 125 times. So you know these things, they all add up. It gets very expensive. Um, and the, only, the main reason to use cross-validation is that after doing this, you don't end up with a lot of data here, right? Your training data gets very small. And if that's not a big problem, if this is still if this is such a huge data set that this is still a lot of data, then you don't really need cross validation. So you might speed things up for yourself. Uh, second lecture, second lecture uh, of this week, uh, we talked about lots of different things: how to normalize your data, how to uh, whiten your data, how to deal with outliers, how to deal with um, Missing values. I uh, said so it's all very important, but this is a very basic principle um, that I think it's good to keep in, keep in mind. If you're confused about whether or not something is right, whether you're, you're allowed to do something, like if I normalize my training data, should I normalize my test data as well, or is, is that not allowed? Um, if I if my t training uh, or if my data has a, a temporal dimension, uh, how do I validate then? What's the right way to validate then? <coughs> And you can get a long way by imagining a realistic production scenario for your data. So imagining where your classifier is going to be used. And ultimately, the value you want to get out of your test data, when testing on your test data, is an estimate for how well your model is going to do in this production phase. 
that doesn't necessarily mean you're building a big system or a big computer system. Uh, they can use, uh, machine learning models can be used anywhere, but there's usually some realistic setting that you're trying to, uh, trying to, get, uh, uh, to optimize the model for. And your test set is a proxy for that setting. So if you're confused uh, in any of these projects, try and think back to the real world use case. Uh, so probabilistic models, lots of probability. This is a picture I was trying to draw earlier. <coughs> uh, so lots to choose from, difficult to choose a slide, so I picked this one. Um, I think because it shows, well, uh, this is, uh, first of all, to explain what it is, this is the logistic regression model with one feature here and uh, two classes, red and blue. And these classes we put on an axis representing the probability of seeing the blue class. So for the red points, that probability is zero, and for the blue points, that probability is one. And then we fit this sigmoid curve through it, which is just a linear model passed through a sigmoid. And what you see here is that the residuals are very close, uh, that the largest residuals, the residuals are largest for those points near the decision boundary. So the points that are pulling strongest on this line, the points that are determining uh, most uh, clearly the shape of this line are the ones near the decision boundary. Um, so it's logistic regression. I think that's probably the most important probabilistic model we've talked about. But it's difficult to make a choice in this one. So then we talked about deep learning. I explained neural networks. I explained... Um, <coughs> how to build neural networks and how some of these models uh, correspond to very simple neural networks. So logistic regression is a neural network, class uh, linear classification is a neural network, linear regression is a neural network. Uh, just very simple single layer ones. And then we talked about backpropagation. So this is coming back to gradient descent. Backpropagation is a version, uh, uh, no sorry, backpropagation is a way to do gradient descent. If you have a very complicated model, consisting of lots of pipelines chained after, uh, sorry, lots of modules chained after one another, like neural network layers. The difficult problem, if you want to apply gradient descent, the difficult problem becomes how to work out the gradient for this very complicated model. And backpropagation is the algorithm that makes that simple for us. That says, because your, mod, uh, your model is modular, because your model consists of these modules, you can work out the gradient in a modular way. So if we describe our system as a composition of modules, neural network layers, we can use the chain rule and uh, apply it locally to each module without working out the full gradient as a separate function. We can apply it locally and work out numerically the gradient uh, in an accurate and fast way. Uh, I say numerically, it's a kind of mixture of a numeric and symbolic method, because you need the symbolic description of your model. Uh, model. You need the neural network as a, described as a symbolic function. But ultimately, the value that you're going to get out is not a formula, not a formulaic description of the gradient, but a numeric value of the gradient at a specific point for a specific set of arguments of your neural, uh, neural network. <coughs> so that's backpropagation. It's probably the most important thing we talked about in that lecture. And we talked about SVMs, and uh, I came up with this picture at the end, which I was quite pleased with, so let me describe what you're seeing here. These are the three loss functions uh, we applied to linear classification. So we had this problem that linear classification, the thing that you're trying to optimize usually is accuracy. If you use accuracy as a loss function, your loss surface is going to be very flat and rigid and you don't actually get gradient information. So you need a different loss function that still puts the minimal, uh, still puts the minimum at a good model, that is still a good proxy for this accuracy. So our first attempt was least squares, just to give you a, a first, uh, first shot, uh, which is not a very practical loss function. And basically what least squares does, um, so here we, again we have a data set with one feature, x, uh, and we extend the points into this space, so we assign 
the red points the value minus one and we assign the blue points the value mi uh, plus one and then we treat it as a linear regression problem. So we take the differences between the points and what the model predicts, we square those and we sum them and that's our loss function. So what you see is it's like tying rubber bands between the points and the, the line in your model. And what you see here is that the points that are the furthest away from your decision boundary here are the ones that pull the hardest on the line, are the ones that have the most say in where the decision boundary is eventually going to end up. Which is usually not what you want. Usually these are the points that are absolutely obvious, for which the class is absolutely obvious and any model is going to do well. And these are the points near the decision boundary that you want to focus on. Usually. Not always, but usually. So the other two loss functions, uh, they fix that. Well, we've seen cross entropy already, so here we assign zero and one to the labels and we interpret them as probabilities. And we make the model output probabilities and then we fit it using uh, cross entropy. So again, we have these rubber bands, uh, but where we get the square here, we end up, uh, so here we sum the squares of these distances. Here we sum the logarithm of these distances, because that follows from the cross entropy. Uh, so not only do the uh, points near the decision boundary pull stronger on the line in this case, um, it's also much less sensitive to outliers. Because here, if this one is twice as big as this one, it pulls four times as hard because we take the square. And here, if this one is a hundred times as big as this one, it pulls only twice as hard, roughly, because we take the logarithm. Um, so that's uh, logistic regression with a cross entropy loss. And then we talked about the um, support vector machines, which quite simply ignore most of the data. And they simply say, we're going to look at which ones, uh, which points are closest, uh, no, let me say it properly. Um, assuming that our data is linearly separable, we are going to look at the points which are, um, for which the margin to our decision boundary is the biggest. And then we're going to look only at those points. So in this case, <coughs> so we're using a soft margin SVM, so these points we ignore. And these are our support vectors. And we fit, just fit a line through the support vectors. And all of these are ignored, which is very easy to do in two dimensions. In more dimensions, it get, gets more tricky to figure out either what the support vector should be or what the line should be, and it turns out to be the same problem. And as you can see, because we're using a soft margin SVM, we can allow some of the points uh, to uh, be on the wrong side of the support vector, but then we pay a penalty, which is the uh, size of the green bar here. That's the penalty we pay for having points on the wrong side of the uh, support vector. And these penalties are linear. So s squared penalties, logarithmic penalties, linear penalties. We just sum the size of these bars and that gets added to our loss function. But all of these points here, they don't add to the loss function at all. So support vector machines. Um, then we came back to probabilistic models. We talked about, um, well, first we talked a little bit about the normal distribution and then about hidden variable models, specifically about the EM algorithm. Um, and mostly in the context of Gaussian mixture models. Gaussian mixture models are models which are the sum of multiple of these normal distributions. And it turns out these are a lot more difficult to fit. Because if for every point in your data set, so let's say this is a data set which is sampled from two Gaussians, one here, one here. If for every point in your data set you know which Gaussian it belongs to, which component it belongs to, then it's very easy. You just split your data set along uh, these components and you fit your multivariate normal distribution to each. And we know how to fit a multivariate normal distribution, that's easy, so then you can solve this problem. The problem is we have this hidden information, this hidden variable that we don't know the value of for all of our data. 
and we need to infer it from the data, and then suddenly the problem becomes <coughs> much, much more difficult. And on an intuitive level, what EM does is it says, well, <coughs> if I know my, uh, M, uh, if I know my uh, Gaussians, then I get a probability distribution over which point belongs to which Gaussian, right? So if these are my two Gaussians, if this is my model, which is completely the wrong model, but assuming that it is, then this point almost certainly came from this model because it's so much closer to here than it is to here. So we can figure out, we can assign points to components. And the other way around, if we know uh, which uh, component every point belongs to, we can just fit some MVNs to each component. So what EM does, it uh, makes one assumption and then iterates. So first it just picks a bunch of models randomly, then assigns the points, colors the points uh, by which model they're most likely to belong to in a soft way. So we have very red models, very blue models, and sort of purple models in the middle, uh, uh, points, sorry, very red points, very blue points, and purple points in the middle. Then it throws away the model and refits the model to the uh, colored points, which as you can see is not a very good fit yet. And then it reassigns, uh, recolors the points and so on. And when, if you iterate this well, uh, long enough, then you converge to a, a local optimum. So that's EM. And we came back to deep learning. Uh, we talked about GANs, we talked about VAEs. Very difficult, very complicated lecture, lots of math. But really the most important point, I think, uh, the most important part, I think, is this one. Is that if you want to turn a neural network, which are these big powerful things, um, but they're deterministic, they always do the same thing for some input, they always give the same output. If you want to turn one of these neural networks into a probability model, so that you can do probability stuff with it, you can make it generate stuff or you can fit it to a data distribution, then one way to do that, and the most interesting way to do that, is to uh, sample a random input from a standard normal distribution, feed it to the network, and observe the output. So a standard normal distribution plus a big neural network gives you a very interesting probability distribution. So this is a diagram for a neural network, so lots of layers in the middle which you then need to fit, and that's difficult. For that, you need either GANs or VAEs. But this is the basic principle. This is the model that it all boils down to. And then we talked about decision trees. I sort of started with decision trees in the beginning, gave them as an, an, ex as an example, but I never really explained to you how the uh, fitting algorithm works. It's a very simple algorithm, but you need some probability. So I left that for uh, week five. Uh, and I look back at this slide and the description of the algorithm was a little bit fuzzy. So let's, and that's mostly because it's so difficult to describe in words or in pictures what it does, but actually the algorithm is very simple. It's just that you have this recursion in it which makes the description difficult. So if you want to build a decision tree, basically what you need to decide is um, for each node what feature to split on. And this all standard decision tree learning algorithms just start with the root node, decide the feature for the root node. So let's say genre. Then you get three genres, romance, forget what genres I had, science fiction and action maybe. And you get three nodes and for those three nodes you need to decide again, either am I going to stop there, so this might become a leaf node and then I'm going to label it with an outcome, like a class, or if I'm going to split again, and if so, which feature am I going to split on. And whenever I have to decide on a new feature to split on, I just pick the feature greedily, the feature that gives me the highest information gain. And information gain is explained in the lecture. So this is all we're doing, we're just start with the root node and we're extending it downwards. And that's a little bit difficult to describe, but this is the simplest I could come up with. <coughs>
Um, so if you don't understand this, this is what I mean. So sequential data, oh, this is an animated slide actually. Sequential data, uh, again, we talked about lots of interesting models. We talked about uh, Markov models and how they reduce to Bayesian models. Uh, we talked about word-to-fact embedding models uh, for word vectors, and we talked about recurrent neural networks like LSTMs, which are all very interesting. Uh, but probably this is the most important part. If you're dealing with sequential data, you have this problem that you, basically you don't want to test on data that is from the future. Uh, sorry, you don't want to test a model that is trained on data which from the perspective of your test set is from the future. So your model can't have seen data from the future during training because that never happens. If you run a model in production, your model is never going to see data from the future. So your test set should always contain data that is after your training set. It's a basic principle. You should respect this timeline in your data. Which means that any test data you split off, you withhold, needs to be at the end of your timeline. Uh, and if you're going to do cross-validation, or uh, validation in any case, uh, well, if you do just sing, uh, simple validation, you just split your data here, and you res also respect your uh, timeline here, your, uh, your time dimension here. And if you do cross-validation, you can do walk-forward cross-validation, where you just move forward like this. Uh, um, so then we talked about matrix models, uh, and specifically about recommender systems, which are a kind of slightly different setting, slightly different twist on this uh, basic, uh, basic recipe of machine learning, where you can have two sets of objects, like users and movies, about which you don't know anything at all. So you don't know anything about your users, except how many of them there are. And you don't know anything about your movies, except how many of them there are. But you do know which user likes which movie. And not for every possible combination, but for a few, uh, few combinations, users have given you, uh, given you their, their rating, their judgment. And it turns out that from only this information, you can actually come up with quite a lot of uh, knowledge. You can learn quite a lot about what your movies are, how they're related to each other, and what your users are, and how they're related to each other. So we saw this plot, after, all, after I discussed all the math, we saw this plot of the movies using just this kind of matrix information, where actually you got the action movies on one side, and the uh, worthy art house movies on one side, and the romantic movies on one side, and everything was laid out very neatly, very semantically, purely from this kind of information. And you do that with matrix factorization, which I discussed in the, in the lecture. Uh, oh, we're already out of time. Um, and then I talked about reinforcement learning. Oh yeah, one thing I want to mention quickly. At this point, so after three models, that was the point where we had the last homework. So these last three, uh, three lectures, sequential data, matrix models and reinforcement learning, uh, they're much, much less important in the exam. There are still questions about them, but there are no mathematical questions about them, and slightly flu fewer questions. So if you want to fo uh, optimize your exam results, focus on the first 10 lectures. Um, so exploration versus exploitation is probably the most important thing. So we talked about lots of different uh, interesting algorithms for machine learning. But probably the principle that is most useful uh, later on, in, in, uh, even if you never do anything for the rest of your life with machine learning, even if you do, uh, or, or with AI or anything, uh, you're probably going to run into situations where you go, hey, that's an exploration versus exploitation situation. For instance, if you start up a company, which has nothing to do with machine learning, um, you can still face dilemmas like this, uh, where at the start of your, the run of your company, you need to 
fail often. You need to learn things. You need to uh, learn where the opportunities are. You need to learn where the good clients are. You need to learn how the business works. So you need to fail often in order to learn things, because that's how we learn. Which means you need to explore, but every failure is also going to cost you. So if you optimize exploitation, then you're going to try and reduce failures as much as possible, so you don't pay in the short term, so you don't go bankrupt. But in the long term, you actually want to fail so that you learn stuff for later. So you want to fail as much as your wallet allows, essentially. So that's an exploitation versus an exploration versus exploitation dilemma. So that's all the lectures. Uh, yeah, let's see if we, we can um, uh, find some things that cross the boundaries of lectures. I'll go through this a bit quickly. Uh, so I tried to draw some pictures of how everything relates and how stuff uh, hangs together. Uh, for instance, I sort of talked about this already. So we talked about search and models. So we have search and models. Lots of search methods. We uh, talked about random search, which is an approximation to gradient descent. Simulated kneeling is a form of random search with a slight twist. We have stochastic gradient descent, which does gradient descent, but on small batches of data. We have backpropagation, which is a way to estimate your gradient or compute your gradient so that you can do gradient descent. We have expectation maximization, which is a search algorithm for probabilistic models with hidden variables. So these are all search algorithms. If you want to define a search algorithm, you need a loss function, like least squares loss, support vector machine loss, or cross entropy, which should be above the line. Uh, and then cross entropy is an integral part of the model, if you want to call it a model. Most of these things are a package of both the model or search method and the uh, loss function. But logistic regression uses cross entropy. You have softmax activation, which is part of a neural network, and linear regression, etc. So I try to sort of show a little bit how things fit together. Uh, what else do we have? Different settings. So we have the basic setting, the sequence setting, the matrix setting. And the offline setting, which is re reinforcement learning, is off, uh, sorry, this should say online. The on is an online setting, so reinforcement learning. Um, we have two ways of doing sequences, separate sequences as instances, or data as one big sequence. So this, for instance, if you have a set of emails, then every email is a sequence of language. But every in instance is still independent, right? The emails don't necessarily form part of the same sequence. Or if you have one sequence of price data for one stock, then your whole data is one big sequence. So these are just two different settings. Uh, and in deep learning, it's sort of a different beast. You can do all of these things using deep learning models. But the key to deep learning is that you usually you try and get rid of feature extraction, so you don't do manual feature extraction. But you look at the raw data and uh, you let the, uh, let the model learn how to extract features. Uh, and the models get more complex, but the search is always backpropagation. Uh, well, this is basically just a word cloud for probability. All of these things you should know at least roughly what they mean, except the base optimal classifier, which we didn't discuss. So if you don't, then this is a good learning aid for the uh, exam. Similarly here, these are all the tricks you can use if your learning model doesn't work or if you want to solve some machine learning problem. These are all the tricks you need to know about. Again, maybe a good learning aid. And then these are, in the end, all the abstract tasks that we ended up discussing. So we talked about classification, regression, probability estimation or density estimation, generative modeling, dimensionality reduction, reinforcement learning, and recommendation. Those are all the tasks we talked about. Um, so let's take a break there and talk about the exam after the break and then discuss Outlook. All right, um, let's get started again. Find your seat. Uh, sorry, I'm starting slightly too late. I was distracted by questions. Um, so we were, we did the review. So now let's talk the exam. Um, 
basically the, probably the reason you're here. Uh, let me find the starting point. It's a little okay. My laptop is having trouble today. Oh, there's some background process that I should be killing, probably. OK, so 32 squares. These are the number of hours you have left reasonably to uh, study for the exam. Because today you're going to go to the work group and you're going to travel home and you'll be tired and you'll uh, watch some TV so you won't get much done. So you start tomorrow, assuming you work in the weekend and assuming you don't have any other exams and assuming you don't have to work. This is the time you have left. So that's 32 hours. And that's assuming you study for uh, eight hours a day, which is quite a long time to study in one session. And if you watch all the lectures back to back, then afterwards you'll have this left. So that's not a good strategy to study for the exam. Um, so you're third year students, you know how to study for an exam, but still let's go through some, uh, some tricks uh, anyway, first thing to notice, I hope you all know this when you're watching the lectures uh, on YouTube, you can increase the speed. And this is very useful. I know I do this when I edit the lectures. And I notice when actually, when you set the speed to twice as fast, I, it sound, I actually sound quite good. <laughs> so I probably should talk twice as fast. Um, but I can't. So we'll have to do it using technology where I record the lecture and then you watch it back twice as fast. Uh, it's also very good to keep your attention. So if you're listening to somebody speak at a normal rhythm, your attention tends to drift and you tend to think about doing other things. Uh, and here you have to do it secretly so as not to upset me, but when you're at home you can check Twitter as much as you like. But if you set the speed higher, it sort of keeps your brain in gear and you keep paying attention. So that's a very effective solution. Um, so I hope you all know about that trick. And if not, then now you do. Um, and before we go into the exam itself, let's just talk briefly about procrastination. I always wish people had told me more about this when I was a student. So this is the big problem, right? You have four days left. Most of you are going to waste at least one of them thinking I'm definitely going to study and then you don't study. And then you figure out um, at the end of the day you've wasted the whole day probably on one of these uh, giving these corporations money in one way or another. Um, the first thing about procrastination, the first thing to understand is that it's not a personality flaw. So it's not because you're lazy and it's not because you're, you don't have any willpower. If you think about it like that, then it's, you're never going to solve it because it's, the solution is to have more willpower and you're not going to get that. That's not something... Uh, yeah, if you reduce it to a personality problem, something that is fixed, then it's, you're also reducing it to something that is not fixable. When actually it's more of a motivation and a psychology problem, where if you make something, especially if you make something too important for yourself, or if you make something too big for yourself, so if you turn this into a really big problem, then you get demotivated. Uh, and it's especially with things that you want to do well. So if you're well, nobody's excited or, uh, about an exam, but if you're excited about a project or a presentation that you have to give, and you say, I want to do this really well, then immediately it becomes very big in your head, and you stop wanting to work on it. You want to do it well, and you're excited about it, and then suddenly you don't want to prepare for it, and you become, as it were, kind of scared for it. You get this fear, and then if you're afraid of something, then checking Twitter gives you five minutes of not thinking about that fear. And that creates a little dopamine loop, that creates a little, little bit of addiction, a little bit of addictive behavior, where the more you check Twitter, the more you reduce the fear, and the more you're not thinking about this, 
big thing that you have to do. And it, it can really feel like addiction. It can feel absolutely miserable to start doing this thing that you're actually supposed to enjoy. I mean, again, not the exam, but uh, other things, like a, a big project. Uh, so how do we deal with this? Once you get into this loop, once you get into this, stuck into this, uh, this pit, how do you deal with this? A um, couple of tricks that I like, anyway. Firstly, is to, to shrink it. So it's too big in your head. You're afraid of this big thing, so make it a small thing. So instead of saying, let's make it personal, instead of saying, I have to pre prepare a whole two-hour lecture for tomorrow, I can say, um, let's at least make some, uh, make some flashcards or pick the topic or do some research. So I'm not going to think about doing the whole lecture, but I'm going to think about researching this specific topic. Or if I can't do that, I'm going to think about just sitting down at my computer and opening up Keynote. And the same with your exam. So if, this ex if you find yourself getting stuck and not able to work on this exam, just think about the smallest possible thing that you can do, just five minutes of work. What's, what can you do in just five minutes to get you started? Because once you're started, once you're there in front of your computer or in front of your books, then suddenly the mindset changes. So reduce it to, reduce it to something five minutes big that you can do. And don't think about the whole project, don't think about the whole thing, reduce it to something small. Um, then get an overview, get a sense of this whole big thing that you're afraid of, what it actually consists of. So get some kind of real, instead of thinking of it as some big amorphous blob, um, get a sense of the structure of it. So for instance, if, again, if I have a, to prepare a lecture, what I do is I get a bunch of these cards, which are probably very useful in exam preparation as well, and I just map out the whole lecture on paper. And once I've done that, the thing becomes really easy because I have this whole thing laid out and I have like a, something like a timeline in front of me. All I have to do is take each card and put it into the computer and I can see the stack and I can see the stack shrinking and I just know how far along and how far I am from being done. And that's really motivating. I mean, there's research that shows us that if you can see how far you are from being done, the closer you get to being done, the more motivated you get. But that does mean you need to see how far you are from being done. And in an exam, that can be difficult. So get a timeline for yourself. Map out, I'm going to check all the lectures or I'm going to check all the book, I'm going to check all of this or that. And uh, yeah, get a, get a, find a way for yourself to map out what the whole project is. So you can see that you're getting closer to finishing. And then, of course, kill your perfectionism, because perfectionism is to see, it's the enemy. Don't try and make it perfect, so don't try and, especially for exams, because exams are stupid and pointless. Uh, don't tell people I said that, but... <laughs> I mean, in the long term, they are pointless. We, we need them, but in the long term, you're not here to, finish, to uh, get a good grade for the exam. You're here to learn about machine learning. And the exam is just a flawed way of checking whether or not you've done that. So don't worry too much about the exam, and don't think about how can I answer every question correctly. Just what can I do in the next 30 minutes to answer one more question correctly than I would have done if I'd spent this 30 minutes doing something else. So what's, how can I just improve my chances by one little bit and then take another step and then do another little bit? Uh, finally, this has been a lifesaver for me, the Pomodoro Technique. Who knows about the Pomodoro Technique? Who's heard about this before? Uh, so it's about 50-50, so it's worthwhile telling you about this. Um, it's a very simple trick. Basically, you set a kitchen timer, usually an app on your smartphone these days, there's good apps for this. Um, for 25 minutes, and in those 25 minutes you work concentrated and focused. And then you take a break. And both are important. So it's important to get focused right away when the timer starts, and it's important to stop right away when the timer goes off. And both are equally difficult. It's difficult to get started, and it's difficult to stop. Uh, 
But if you think of your concentration or your motivation as a kind of engine, it can be this runway process where you suddenly get this brilliant focus and you do lots of work at once. And it's as important to stop that when it goes too far as it is to get going when you're not motivated. Because if you work too hard in one stretch, you sort of burn yourself out and then it's not um, sustainable. Then the next day you won't do anything. If you get a massively productive day where you work eight hours and you get lots of stuff done, the next day you will have a shit day because you burn through all your mental energy as well. Anyway, it's a very good system, so try it, see if it works for you, it worked for me. And it's also very good to help you shrink your task. So instead of thinking about a day of uh, studying for the exam, think about doing one Pomodoro, one 25-minute session. And if you can't get yourself to do one 25-minute session, think about doing a five-minute session. Just set a five-minute timer, and in five minutes, I'm going to do as much as I can, and then I can go back to Netflix. And before you know it, you will be in the zone, and you will be motivated to keep going. So let's pretend the exam is not on Tuesday, but let's pretend it starts in 10 minutes. Uh, what can you do in 10 minutes? Imagine this, uh, what would you do if I told you now that you have to examine 10 minutes while well, you would riot and kill me, but uh, pretend you would go along with that. What can you, uh, what would be the best way to spend 10 minutes to increase your chances of making the exam? I would say, what I, I think what I would do is get the practice exam out, pick a random question, and look it up in the slides. Pick a random question that I don't know the answer to and try and look that answer up in the slides. And probably that would take 10 minutes. Maybe I can do two questions if I'm quick. Um, and the point is that that might seem pointless because the, I'm not going to ask the same questions again that I asked in the practice exam. But actually, the practice exam is quite a, it's quite a good way of sampling parts of the material that, are used, that I'm likely to ask about. Because the, uh, there's a sort of distribution over the material, some things I'm not going to ask about, some things I am going to ask about. If you sample from the practice exam and look at those things discussed there and the things around them, then that's quite a good way of sampling the relevant parts of the literature. So if you only have 10 minutes left, then start with the practice exam. Um, I kind of forgot what I was going to talk about. If you have 30 minutes left, you can probably run through the whole practice exam and see which parts you don't know about. And if you have a whole day left, well, you can do, uh, what is it, 8 times 6 of these, or you can do 16 of these. Uh, so then you break it up into smaller chunks, into very small steps, and instead of taking one very big step, you just take a long sequence of very small steps. Okay, enough uh, philosophy about motivation and uh, productivity techniques. Let's talk about the actual exam. My tips for the actual exam. So firstly, focus on the lectures, don't focus on the book. I kind of apologize for the way the book has been uh, left out of my... Uh, out of the course um, in the last seven weeks. I wanted to integrate it more, but it just didn't fit quite well and it didn't turn out to be a very good book. Um, if you have done the reading, don't worry. There are questions about specifically about the book, uh, so you will get your points for doing the reading, but there aren't that many of them. So if you're starting out now and you haven't read anything of the book or you haven't understood any of the stuff you've read in the book, focus on the lectures. You will get the best return on investment if you just make sure you know the lectures. Um, and I'd say, before you watch the videos, read the slides first. Because watching a video at twice the speed will give you 45 minutes per lecture. You can probably read the whole thing through, at least very quickly, uh, in 15 minutes. If you just read the slides and write down some keywords. And that will already give you the structure. That will already tell you the things you know about, the things you understand, and the things you don't understand. So it will tell you where to zoom in later. So if you're doing a thick, uh, first quick read-through, I would read instead of watch, and then watch later specifically those things that you're having trouble with. 
Uh, like I said earlier, focus on the first 10 lectures because the homework is about the first 10 lectures. And I only ask difficult questions about stuff you've practiced in the homework. So if you haven't practiced it in the homework, I won't ask difficult questions about this. So the last three lectures will only be, there will only be uh, easy questions. And then, yeah, like I said, make quick pad. Don't start at the beginning now so that you end up at the end on Monday, but circle around. Make quick passes, faster, uh, quick passes and then zoom in on the stuff you don't uh, know about. Uh, the exam uh, consists of four answers, uh, four questions, sorry, uh, each with four answers in multiple choice. There is no open questions, no anything, just 40 multiple choice questions, 40 choices between A, B, C, and D. And there are three categories. Recall, which is about 40% of the questions. These were supposed to be one third each, but it ended up like this. That happens sometimes. So about 40% is recall, which means just remembering something I told you. It's not, it's not more difficult than that. You just have to understand what I, tell, uh, what I tell you enough to remember it. Combination is, well, ideally, if with a good combination question, it's remembering two things uh, and combining them in order to answer a question. So not only do you have to remember stuff, but it has to be, uh, you have to understand it well enough to really play around with it and combine it and say, well, then that's the answer. So these are the sort of slightly more tricky questions where you really have to understand what I'm talking about. And then application are the ones, well, stuff we've practiced in the homework, where you actually have to do something. You have to write something, uh, follow an algorithm, compute something, stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, it's not... Uh, the homework is more difficult than the exam by design. So if you can do the homework, you can also do the exam, but not necessarily the other way around. Uh, so don't worry if the homework, if you find the homework difficult, don't worry about that too much. Uh, then when you're reading these things or when, you, or when you're following the slides and you don't understand things, like there's lots of math like this that um, most of you uh, may struggle with, and you don't really have to understand it. I put it in there so you know the basic principle, and if you uh, like this stuff, you can follow it. And if you, uh, b but it's, it may not be for everybody, and it may not be something that you get right away, or that you, at the moment, have the time to, to invest in. So that's fine. If you get to a point like that, where you think, okay, I don't get what's going on here, try and find the in point and the out point. I've tried very hard to say, okay, now there's, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to try to achieve, now there's a bit of math, and now we're here, and now we have this. So try and find those points. The point where we started off from, and the point where we uh, tried to get to, and try and figure out why we needed to get between, uh, from the starting point to the end point, and then you can skip the math in between. Usually, the math is not actually that important, What's important is why we started out with this, what all of this means, and why we needed to rewrite it to this, and what we can do with this version that we couldn't do with this version, for instance. This is from the support vector machine lecture. So try and find those points, and then don't worry about too much about the math in between. Uh, finally, a couple of tricks I uh, used myself when I was a student that worked for me. Uh, so it's good if you're, especially if you're doing these quick passes, you need to get something out of it. So to compose just a quick list of keywords. If you have a big list of keywords for the exam, just subjects that were discussed, things that were interesting, you can then sample, you can then test yourself. So sample a random point, uh, sample a random keyword, and ask yourself, do I understand what this means? If you don't, then you know what to do. You dive into the lecture at that point and see if you can figure it out. If you do, great, you can move on. But first, you need this global overview of the lecture and of all the keywords. Um, and on Canvas, there's a page called Terminology, or Terminology Notation, where I've sort of given you a head start already. I made this page at the same time as I was preparing the exam. So there might be some... Yeah, that this might be an especially good place to start. Just a little hint. Um, 
then a good thing to do is to come up with your own exam questions. So if you're reading something and you think, I can't think how you could possibly ask a multiple choice exam question about this, then it's probably not going to be in the exam. So skip to something else. Uh, so this is not only a good way to practice your own knowledge, but also to filter out stuff that's probably not going to be in the exam. On the other hand, I am quite good at coming up with exam questions by now, so I might come up with questions that you haven't thought about, but still it's a good way to focus in on the right points. Uh, skip this one, and finally, um, this is very important. Make pers if you don't understand something, don't sit back and think, I don't get it, screw it, but try and make it more precise. So there's a process where you think, okay, there's something I don't understand, what is it, and how can I focus in on that? And usually, this is something like, I don't understand why this is necessary, I don't understand how to get from here to there which has two advantages. Firstly, you can ask me. If you turn it into a precise question, you can ask me and I will answer. I will be online and I will be checking my email and especially the discussion board until the very last minute. But also it tells you where to look and how to zoom in. Um, then there's recommended reading. Now you might think I'm having enough trouble as it is with the uh, reading that I don't understand, why would I want to add more reading? But actually, this is a really good way to understand. If there's something you don't understand, a really good way to get to a point where you do understand it is to very quickly read or look at different explanations, to find lots of different explanations, look at all of them, and find one that's at your level. Because if you find a good explanation that is at the level that you need it to be explained to you at that moment, that can save you hours and hours of time. Um, so look around if there's something, if you have something specific in mind that you don't understand, look around and say, okay, uh, I'm, I, need, I need somebody else to explain this to me in a different way. Uh, so there's recommended reading on the canvas, and I've tried to make it um, sources that explain it in, in helpful ways. Um, specifically, I wanted to point you to the Google course uh, introduction to Machine Learning, which is just uh, made public a few weeks ago. Um, which basically talks about almost, yeah, uh, follows a very similar path to the one I did, and talks about a lot of the same things. Sometimes they make it simpler, sometimes they make it more difficult. But it's a very good place to start, and they have a glossary. So if you have a specific thing that you don't understand, you can just look it up in this list. And the second thing I wanted to point out, uh, if you're struggling with probability, there's a page called Seeing Theory, which is getting better and better. It was already quite good when they first uh, published it, but now it's getting uh, even better, where they basically just walk you through the basics of probability with very, very well-designed interactive uh, sort of widgets or apps or whatever you want to call it. So this is a very good way to learn the basics of probability, which is always a tricky uh, part of the preliminaries. Uh, yeah, if you do have questions, please put them on the discussion board. I mean, you can email me if it's really embarrassing or whatever, but uh, it's much more helpful for everybody if stuff happens on the discussion board, because then everybody can see it. So uh, please, if at all possible, ask your questions there. I will be checking it multiple times a day in the next few days. And that's all I had for the exam. So I have five minutes left for the things I've planned for the second half. So I'll run through this quickly, well, very quickly. Um, yeah, I've looked at the slides. It's, I mean, it's not part of the exam, so it's not that important, but have a look at the slides if you uh, want to know more about this stuff. Uh, there's lots of stuff we talked about, lots of stuff we didn't talk about, so you need to be... Uh, aware that there is more to machine learning than the stuff we've discussed so far. There are things like concept learning, item set mining, I won't go into these. Uh, so that's stuff you might, uh, you might see in the future if you continue doing machine learning. So now just to round up, to put a little bow on it, let's talk a little bit about what machine learning 
will mean for us, will mean for you even if you don't start out doing machine learning, if you don't continue in the direction of machine learning, you are probably going to work at least with computers, or at the very least with data. And the world is changing as a consequence of these machine learning methods. Uh, so let's start with the, the small ways things will change. This is a very good article on a journal called Distill, where they were basically saying, well, it's not all about AI. It's, uh, it's not all about standalone artificial intelligence. It's also about how a, um, these methods of machine learning and a general AI are going to augment our intelligence. So this is augmented uh, AI, uh, artificially, artificially intelligent, well, it's artificial intelligent and augmentation in some permutation, I forget which one. Basically what they're doing here, what they're showing, uh, they trained a sort of uh, autoencoder on fonts, and they showed that, if you, that you can build this kind of interface for people, where you basically uh, give people a slider, and they can make things more bold and less, uh, more italic or more condensed. And this is a kind of interface that we can start to build, where we can take these, uh, these models and we can work out these manipulations and then give people the tools to manipulate data in that way. We've seen a few examples of this already, like the smiling vector. So you can take a picture, do lots of autoencoder stuff, work out the smiling vector, and you can make somebody smile or frown by taking a slider and moving it back and forth. So that's going to have a massive influence on things like image editing. And if you have a good language model, you can do something like take this sentence and make it shorter. Give me a sentence that expresses the same thing but make it shorter. This, this is a real example, this is a fictional example so far, but we're getting there. And you can do the same thing with like molecules. I don't know what a delayed fluorescence decay rate is, but I'm, you can do this with these kinds of autoencoders. Uh, so the way we interact with computers and the way we manipulate data is going to change a lot. Uh, and you are probably going to be the people to build these kinds of systems. Uh, even if you don't care about uh, user interfaces, the backend is also going to change due to something called end-to-end -end learning. So imagine you're analyzing news articles. Uh, the way we used to do this, well, was in pipeline of steps, right? So if you want to do automatic analysis of old news articles, you need to scan them. You need to do OCR, so char character recognition. Then you get a language, then you do something like named entity recognition, so you recognize which parts of the sentences, which part of the language refer to entities. You do relation extraction, what relations are being expressed between these entities, and then you do reasoning over that. It's sort of an old-fashioned way to do artificial intelligence systems. And you can do this for anything, for speech analysis, for lots of these stuff. So you, uh, you get these pipelines of modules that all use machine learning, that all do their job, and they do their job pretty well, but not perfectly. So they all have a an accuracy or a, a performance of something like 99%. Problem is, if you take a bunch of modules that have a performance of 99%, and you chain them together, your whole pipeline as a whole is not going to have a performance of 99%. It's going to have crap performance. Because a tiny error will propagate, and you get an exponential blow-up of this tiny error, and your whole pipeline, even though all your modules work very well, your whole pipeline won't work at all. What you need to solve this is end-to-end -end learning. So you need a, an error signal here. Once you put all the pipelines together, you train them, uh, you, the modules together, you need an error signal here that can travel all the way back down this pipeline and tune all of these modules to your specific task that you're doing at the moment in order to get rid of this error propagation. In other words, you need a big neural network with a loss function here, and these functions all need to be differentiable modules, so you can do backpropagation all through your system. And in this way, machine learning, and more specifically deep learning, are kind of like a virus, in that if one of your modules in your pipeline is one of these machine learning things, suddenly the whole thing needs to be differentiable. Suddenly, the whole thing needs to be able not just to compute forward, but to learn backwards as well. 
So the bigger your system gets, the more this is going to influence big computer systems. So big, we're going to see big computer systems that need to be end-to-end -end differentiable all the way. And even if you don't like working on machine learning, if somebody else puts a machine learning module in your pipeline, suddenly you have to deal with this. Which leads to something people call software 2.0 or differential programming. There's some articles you can read about this. Um, it's a sort of extension of machine learning. Uh, all right, I have a video that I'm going to skip. But won't play, so that's good. Um, it's a video about autonomous weapons. It's, it is quite a good video. There's a link in the link in the slides. We have to just oh, there it is. Um, yeah, when I took machine learning. When I started, uh, uh, when I was sort of where you are now, when I first started studying machine learning, we had one lecture on ethics. This was in the master's course, so the ethics of machine learning or the, the social impact of machine learning. And the uh, lecturer asked students afterwards, did you think this was necessary? Did you think this was a good idea to include it? And most of the students, if I remember correctly, weren't that uh, convinced and didn't really see the point of it. Which in those days was kind of, uh, reasonable because the only convincing system that you would encounter in your day-to-day -day lives that would that used machine learning was probably a spam classifier and apart from sp spam classifiers there weren't really actual machine learning systems in production anywhere maybe product recommendations on Amazon but even movie recommendations didn't really work the way uh, they do now so there, um, there wasn't even a real feeling that machine learning was, a, an was going to be an important part of our lives, let alone that it was going to have some social impact. Things have changed. Uh, just this week in the news, just the week that I decided to talk about this, there were three news stories that are relevant to machine learning and that show the social impact of machine learning. Any guesses? Sorry? Yeah, the first uh, fatality in a self-driving car from Uber. Anything else? Sir? No? <laughs> uh, the other two I had, once just for the Dutch people, we just voted. Well, we, we're not sure which way we voted yet, but there was a referendum on the Dragnet law, so this is a massive data collection law. A uh, big stink about a uh, company collecting Facebook data illegally. Um, and then there's the uh, Uber car, so let's start there. Um, just a little bit of Twitter discussion. Basically, this guy is saying, I mean, the first self-driving car fatality, it was going to happen at some point. And uh, partly the question is, is the probability that a, a self-driving car is going to hit somebody, is it l low enough? Is it much lower than that of a human driver? Um, but there are actually some points to actually pay attention, some reasons to actually pay attention to this and to take this seriously. Specifically that Uber has quite a bad record, from a bad record in many domains, but also in this domain. Um, so you can test these self-driving cars, they have a human driver, so you can test the disengagement. How often does the human driver override the system? And it turns out that Uber basically had a disengagement for every one or two miles. And they were being quite irresponsible with putting men these kinds of cars on the road that were disengaging so often. And they were really not taking this problem quite seriously. They were really not, I mean, they're, you're testing a big chunk of metal, that hunk of metal that can accelerate to 60 miles, and you're testing it in a space with ha which has human beings in it. You need to take that seriously. You need to be respectful of, of how, uh, how dangerous that can be. And a lot of these startup companies and a lot of these AI companies, they have a culture of um, make things quickly and break things quickly, iterate quickly and make cool stuff and just break it, which is a good culture if you're making web apps, but not a good culture if you're making self-driving cars. 
Um, and the same thing I saw in the discussion about Cambridge Analytica. So there's somebody, uh, an IT guy who, uh, as he says, came up in physics. And what he's saying is that in physics, people have this, um, this, this era, they had this era of hope and, and uh, where everybody is hopeful and ambitious and building stuff and everything is going to be great. And they have been, um, they've had to face the consequences of what their technology can do, the technology that they've built. Because in chemistry, they've built dynamite and chemical weapons, and in physics, of course, they've built the bomb. And everybody who came up in physics, who learned physics after the 1950s, was trained with this very innate idea of what we're doing here is important, and what we're doing here can have really, really serious consequences. And so people now in IT are um, sort of thinking that we haven't seen the consequences yet, but we're about to see them. And we need to be very careful about the things that we do and the technology that we put into the world. And we need a generation of responsible scientists or scientists who can actually think about this, who can not just have fun building fun projects, but who can also think about the social impact and social consequences of the stuff they're putting into the world. And that generation, that's you guys. So. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of other examples of social impact. Um, this is a black researcher who was, using on, who was researching face, uh, face recognition technology who had actually had to put on a white mask to test her technology because there weren't enough black people in the training set so it didn't work on her face. Uh, she didn't build it herself, she was testing existing technology. Um, there's sort of weird implicit gender bias in language models, stuff like that. And this stuff is actually being used, and it's, it's not, this is not just weird uh, tricks, weird little, things, uh, weird little things in systems. This is actually affecting people's lives today. So this is a big article about software being used to predict uh, which people were at risk, or which people were uh, at risk of being criminals. And this was used by judges and in courts and in criminal investigations and they found out that obviously it had a massive racial bias because it was just trained uncarefully on, on, uh, on uniformly sampled data. So any, all the cultural biases that we have, and especially that Americans have, were sort of stuck into the system implicitly en masse through the data. Um, yeah, so these things are important, and we're, start, we're just starting to talk about this kind of stuff now. Uh, and I hope it's a discussion that will continue. So, uh, yeah, that's just to say this stuff does really uh, affect uh, society and will affect your lives. And you will be the generation who, uh, who will have to deal with this for us. Uh, and that's all I had for you. So thanks, uh, thanks for your attention and good luck with the exam. <laughs>